Well, thank you very. Uh, it's my, my pleasure to be here to address you guys. Um, I'm just going to jump right into my passion, which is artificial intelligence. I think I was interested in dreaming about artificial intelligence when there were just very few people who even knew what it was, and even less people who thought it was possible. And it's been a remarkable journey to see what's happening today, because today is probably one of the, mo one of the most exciting parts of tech that there is, and it's really just beginning. And there's not, not only an enormous uh, number of opportunities for people, but for humanity as a whole. So I think one of the things you're going to get from me today is a passion about, about the past and the future of artificial intelligence, but also hopefully some insights into what its powers are, what its limits are, and how to shape it and direct it as we, you know, as we venture into, into the future. So um, one thing I'm going to talk about is how AI started uh, as a theory-driven science. In other words, where computer scientists would sit down and build theories about how the world works and how it evolved into a data-driven science and what the, what the promise is of that and also what the weaknesses and the challenges uh, are of that approach and the idea that maybe there's a sweet spot in between. And I'll talk about IBM's Watson and reflect on that and that experience I had in building the, the Watson system and where that fell along that spectrum of theory-driven to data-driven as we think about what the pros and the cons are of that. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future of AI as um, something that requires systems that have a deeper understanding of both language and cognition. So that's where I want to take you. So I'll start with uh, artificial intelligence. Like, what is it? Like, how do we define it? How do we really think about it? So there are sort of uh, two really interesting you know, definitions. One was, um, was suggested by Alan Turing and another one by John McCarthy. Um, computer systems whose interactive behavior is indistinguishable from a human's. So um, this is the idea that like, if you put uh, a computer and a machine behind a curtain and just started conversing with them, if you couldn't tell the difference, then you, the computer was considered artificially intelligent. And, and, tell, and, and then the other uh, um, definition suggested by McCarthy, and this was in the 1950s, this was at the uh, conference in Dartmouth where he coined the word actually artificial intelligence, where he defined it more as computer systems that perform tasks that if performed by a human would be associated with intelligence in that, in that human. So sort of very different definitions, but what's interesting about both of them is they both completely avoid defining what intelligence is. <laughs> so they do it sort of in a comparative way. It's comparing it to humans, either humans as a whole or humans in terms of what tasks they can perform. Right? So McCarthy's is much more practical where it says, you know, if you, so for example, if you think, a person who can uh, be a grandmaster at chess, in order to do that, that person must be really intelligent, then a computer program that can play chess would be considered artificially intelligent, or that can play Go, or what have you. But of course, you know, that's a very, very narrow way of defining it, and sort of intelligence isn't sort of smooth in that sense. It's like you might be able to do one thing really well, but be completely incapable of something else. Another way to think about AI systems are systems that, um, uh, two sort of different dimensions about them is like understanding and doing. So you can think of computer programs that understand things, so interpret, communicate, reason, learn, predict. Um, doing is more like robotics, walking, seeing, sensing, catching, driving, flying. I don't know how many people are up on some of the things that could be done in this space, but in recent years, uh, the, the ability of, of programming systems to do things uh, do things we used to associate with really capable. Uh, this robust band consists of throwing and catching, which contrasts with traditional methods that maintain contact state. In the air, and then move to intercept it. This is an extremely. These are three drones. I don't know if you, you guys seen this, but these are three drone, drones cooperating with each other to throw a ball up in the air. Dynamic task with a lot of uncertainty, but very fast dynamics. Yet, only dynamic task with a lot of uncertainty, but very fast dynamics. Yet, this technique for designing control systems is very robust. And this is Boston Dynamics, so they have even more impressive stuff today. But this is a, a system that is balancing itself, walking and, and balancing itself.
This is a robot you can buy and program yourself. But I think one of the most interesting things about all of this is that, um, and I think most representative of, of the point I want to make, besides this being cute and I think everyone should have one, is, um, is more represented by this. Which is, you know, uh, when, when AI was more theory driven to try to, try to imagine programming a machine to figure out how to walk and balance itself on ice, you'd sit there and you'd start thinking about the domain. I'm going to get more and more into this. And you'd start writing down rules about, well, under these conditions, it would do this. And how, I would, how would I detect those conditions? And you'd write like a bunch of if then else's, if you will, that says under these conditions, then do this. And under those conditions, then do this. And this was tedious and never really got you to a really robust capability like this. But now with, with, with machine learning, where the idea is I can, exp I can expose a machine learning algorithm like a neural network, for example, to lots of input data and have the computer learn how to map that to output data. I now can tr uh, automatically train programs to behave in intelligent ways. In other words, to figure out how to control themselves given the different inputs to map to the various outputs without actually a, a, a human writing down and imagining all the details. So I'm going to make that more and more explicit because I think that's a, a really important point to understand how AI has evolving and what the pros and the cons are of that, you know, of that evolution. When we talk about understanding, understanding is a lot more difficult, um, surprisingly. Because right, understanding relates very much to human thought processes. Right? When you say, do we understand each other, what, is that, what does that mean? Right? So let's, let's, let's take a couple of examples to talk about this. So here's chess. So chess is a finite, mathematically well-defined search space. All, all responses are grounded in precise, unambiguous rules. Right? So you have your pieces, you know exactly how they move, you know what all the rules of the game are. are. There's a large but, uh, but ultimately finite set of possible moves that you can explore. In some sense, when you think about how constrained this problem is and how rule-oriented it is, it's actually surprising that humans are any good at it. And you, you, if you think about it, it's like perfect for computers in some sense. So you know, we sit there and we're surprised, wow, we can't believe a computer beat Kasparov. I mean, really? I mean, this is like perfect for a computer in that sense. When, um, and so as long as you can get the computer to explore enough of those moves and try out enough of them ahead of them or faster than the human can, you've got you know, uh, a winning or unbeatable uh, computer program. Human language is very different, right? Here we have, when I mean, and what I mean by languages, I don't mean just um, words, but any symbolic system that represents our understanding of the, word, uh, of the world, a vehicle through which we communicate our understanding. So that's what I mean by language. So words, images, speech, they lack precise interpretation. Is there a nearly infinite number of expressions that map to this huge variety of meaning, right? And, and the meaning is grounded only in shared human experience. So it's highly, highly contextual. So the meaning we assign words, we can't sort of exactly look up. We can look up in a dictionary and find other words. And we can look those up and find other words. And we have this big circular reference. Do we ever get at the actual meaning? Right, so one of the things that in my, in sort of my own personal life that kind of sort of resonated with me on this point was you know, something, a common experience in my household is I call my two daughters down. I'm doing some experiment in the kitchen. I go, you guys got to come down here. This is really, really interesting. I've been doing this since they were like three years old. You guys got to come down here. This is really, really interesting. I'd be cooking up some you know, big experiment that I want. I want to excite them about science. And I would show them, try to take them through that and explain it to them. And so I guess my younger daughter was about seven, six or seven. And here I am going, you guys got to come down here. This is really, really interesting. And she stops at the top of the stairs, and she looks down at me. She goes, Daddy, interesting things are boring. <laughs> um, so you know what she was doing there, her experience with that word interesting was actually a boring experience. And that's the meaning she had associated with the word. So there is no meaning in the word itself. It's really just a pointer to a shared experience. Right, that we all have modeled in our head. So I'm talking to her right now, and I'm looking at people in the audience, and some people are nodding as if they understand me. I really have no idea if you understand me. I mean, I know you hear the words, and I know they're landing somewhere in your brain, but I don't know that they're landing in the place that really uh, reflects what I'm trying to communicate to you. But as you nod, and then uh, you know, when I ask you some questions, you ask me questions, we get in tighter, tighter sync. Right? We, start to we start to increase our probability that, in fact, we have that shared experience and that there's actually meaning there. So one of the things you've got to be careful of is thinking that there's actually meaning in language. The meaning is in our shared experience. And the trick is trying to get at that shared experience. 
So when we program computers, whether it be AI or in, in any place else, we try to extract that meaning, that intention, and put that into structures in the computer that are explicit. So we know exactly what meaning we intended by those words. So imagine that I wanted to talk about where people were born, and I build a relational database with two columns, the person's name and the birthplace. And then I know that if you, if you ask me a question, where was someone born, I would go to the right SQL and the structured query language, and I would look up the person's name you gave me in the first column. I'd pull out the name in the second column, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the name of the city in the second column, and I'd return it to you. And we all understand that what that means is this is where that person was born. And that was, it's all pre-programmed to the computer. The meaning is explicit, and everyone is in sync with that. With that right? But on the other hand, if I say, you know what, I'm just going to give you some words, I'm not going to tell you what they mean, and then I'm going to give you other words, I'm not going to tell you what they mean, and you need to answer that question. So now, for example, where was X born? Whatever X might be, let's say Albert Einstein. And I could read a whole bunch of stuff, and one thing I read is one day from among his city views of Ulm, Otto chose a watercolor to send to Albert Einstein as remembrance of Einstein's birthplace. So someone in there is the answer to the question, how would I know that? I don't know. I'd have to know, kind of know what people are. I have to know what cities are. Um, I'd have to know the relationship between the word born and someone's birthplace. I'd have to have a lot of background knowledge that even gets me to a point where I can start to assign explicit semantics to those words to extract that meaning. This becomes a much harder challenge. Like when we think of that as unstructured information. So right, structured is where there's explicit meaning and we have a contract of what that meaning is. Unstructured is the meaning is not explicit, it's implicit somewhere, and we don't have that contract. We have to figure out how to interpret it based on what the user might want. Here's another example. So we have the CEO column, we have the company column, and we have X ran this. I mean, who knows what that means, right? And we have a, might read a sentence, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. I mean, I might interpret that as Jack Welch was a painter at GE. Right? How do I know without really understanding the implications and the metaphors that are implied by that language? So getting at the meaning of unstructured language becomes difficult because of, again, that, that it's, it's really, the meaning is not in the language. The meaning is in how we map that language to the meaning in our heads, right, the shared experience. Why is getting at meaning so important? Why do we want computers to do that? I mean, I don't know about you, but there's a ton of, ton of information out there and um, I would love a thought partner who can read all that stuff, understand it, communicate it back to me in my language, and help me make decisions. The healthcare bill is 2,000 pages, plus pages, that was years ago, who knows what it is now. The US tax code, 16,000 pages in 2006, 71,000 pages, 2010. I don't know if anybody thinks these, this stuff is gonna get smaller and easier, you're probably wrong. Hundreds of thousands of medical textbooks and journals, Wikipedia is only over five million articles. The internet provides an access to equivalent of a billion of books. So what does it all mean to me? How, help me understand the, this content and apply the meaning to make, help me make better decisions faster. So that's what I want. Like I want that computer like in Star Trek that just starts talking to me, right? That sits down there and says, here, can you read this article and understand it? Can you talk to me about, can you help me solve my problem? So what is meaning? So meaning is kind of this tricky thing, right? Because I can't just stick a probe in your ear and understand and like figure out exactly what you mean about things, right? So I have to get to it through that, that symbol system or that language. So here we have some language, which in this case is actually a, a picture of um, uh, a calculator with some dice on top of it. And the meaning is ultimately subjective, and we the meanings are the subjects. Right? I mean, we the humans are the subjects. We assign the meaning to the content, right? So if we just looked at its representation of the computer, we might see a bunch of zeros and ones, but then if we start interpreting the zero ones, zeros and ones in terms of things that humans understand, like things that are related to how we build models in our head, like color. So now we can assign white, black, and red. We could say this is a white, black, and red picture. We can do object detection. Right, so now we have to get the computer to identify objects that are known, right? Calculator with dice on top. Another interpretation is calculating the odds. The actual image, the image database where I found this was labeled with the word winning. So the meaning that was associated with this image was winning. And of course, human use of tools is another way to, another meaning you might assign to this. So meaning's tricky. Another way of thinking of it, meaning is a probabilistic mapping from symbols to common, sense, common experience. And the context in which those symbols are found 
help you hone or narrow down the interpretation. So here we have, you know, the bat was flying toward him. So you're probably building two possible interpretations in your head, someone competing, right? So one might be like a vampire bat or a giant fruit bat flying towards some person. Another case, you might, you know, someone swung a bat and they let it go and it's fly you're sitting in the audience and the bat's flying, flying toward your friend or something like that. Um, so now it says Billy ran as fast as he could. So you're, you're acquiring more context, you're acquiring more words, you're mapping them into your head, and now you're thinking, well, I still have these two competing interpretations. One is that Billy's running away from the bat, the other one is he flung the bat and he's running toward first base. He made it home safe. You're still confused, right? You're wondering, gee, what the heck is going on here? Did he make it back to his house? Did he make it all the way around and hit a home run? And then finally, he scored. And there's most likely only one interpretation. Perhaps there's another one we won't talk about. But the main one I go to there is um, Billy let, let, you know, Billy was in fact playing baseball, right? So as more and more, more information came in, we were, able to, we were able to kind of compute the probabilities in our heads and narrow down the meeting and get it closer and closer to a, a consistent interpretation that maps to something in, in, in our brain. And of course, you know, the, just varying the words a little bit can change the meaning a lot. So here I just did some image searches on Google and I put in safe at home. And I got mostly baseball, these are the top few images, mostly baseball images. Took the at out and swift, uh, switched it and I got home safe, very different. Just switched those two things, safe home and very different again. And so why is, why is the meaning resolvable on Google? Because people label all these things on Google. Um, and it's basically people assigning meaning and, and they assign you know, meaning even with slight variations in, in the words. So a practical, you know, thinking about meaning, a practical uh, perspective on AI is how to get at the meaning in the data, and then, of course, with the meaning to do something intelligent with it. So first of all, it takes intelligence to get at the meaning. It just doesn't take intelligence, it takes understanding you know, who, who the user is, who the, 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 the source in which the meaning's come from, coming from. Otherwise, how do I make that mapping to meaning? Right, so I have to, so, and humans are the source of meaning. So I need some interaction, some communication with humans to even get access to the meaning. And then I need to figure out how do I effectively map it onto the data or vice versa. And then how do I get the machine to use the meaning to make useful predictions? So how do I reason about it? Or how do I extrapolate from it? And if you look at the history of AI, it went from being very theory driven, very data driven. And I'll, 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 I'll show you what I mean by that. So, so let's start with theory driven. So in theory driven, humans interpret sort of small amounts of data and manually capture meaning in the form of logical models. So we have, and in, in the early days of AI, there wasn't vast amounts of data available, wasn't vast amounts of compute resources, and um, AI scientists would sit down and pick a domain, whatever it might be, medicine, finance, whatever, and start to try to model it. They said, what are the objects, what are the relationships, what are the formal, rules that exist that, that, that capture and describe this domain. And, and they look at reality and they try to build generalizations and they build this big theory, this network of rules like if A of X is true, then B of X is true, and, and then if B of X is true, it'd be a complicated logical model. And then it would get, and then you'd ask it a question and it'd give you an answer. And what was interesting about these answers was that, were that they, they were very predictable. In other words, um, I'm fussing with my cowl here for a second because it's bothering me. Hold on. In fact, I'm just going to take my jacket off. Can I do that? So what happens is that the, um, the answers that a system gives like that is that they're very, they're very predictable. In other words, they're very explicable. So in other words, it can explain. Here's why I got the answer, because I actually understand this theory. So a really great example was from Nate Silver's book called The Signal and the Noise, and he was talking about uh, predictions. And, he, and in this particular section, he was talking about predictions in the financial markets, and he was talking about you know, this recent big recession that happens in 2008. And here's an, an explanation. Consumers have extended too much credit to pay for homes that the housing bubble had made unaffordable. Many of them had stopped making their payments, and there's likely to be substantial losses from this. To the degree of leverage in the system or debt would compound the problem, paralyzing the credit market and the financial industry more broadly. The shock might be large enough to trigger a severe recession. So that's, a re in my opinion, right? That's a good explanation. That's uh, you're, you're, you're understanding the mechanism of how the thing works. 
You're saying why there would be a recession. So there's a model, there's a logical model un un underlying that, right? But now if you take a data-driven approach, it's sort of very different. Here I have an enormous amount of data. Right, if it was in the financial markets, it might be like everything that happened in the past and all the various you know, uh, numbers or, uh, that were derived, like what was happening, described like how, how much sales there were, how much debt there were, the debt levels and everything else. And then you'd, and, and you'd put that all into this big induction machine, which is a statistical machine learning. What I mean by induction is an induction, you look at lots of examples and you generalize a pattern. Or you let the machine do that. So that's what statistical machine learning does. So now I get this prediction, but they're sort of inexplicable. There's no theory. No one sat down and modeled a conceptualization that is compatible with how humans think about the problem. Right? But I get a prediction. So, but this is very powerful, though. With, if you have enough data and you have enough compute power to munge over this data, um, so you look for correlations in the data, for example. Correlation is a very simple way to model this, but it's one way to model this. Um, so in healthcare, e-commerce, Netflix, Amazon, economics, talent, elections, right? So now, again, from Nate Silver's book, we see a very different kind of explanation. The most reliable forward-looking indicators are now collectively behaving as they did on the cusp of a full-blown recession. Very different. There's no indication of a mechanism or anything works. It's just saying, here's what it looked like in the past, it's looking like that now, so I expect the same output. It's like a trend line, right? But if, but if my data represents my phenomenon and the past predicts the future, this can be extremely powerful, but lacks that explanation. So this is such an important distinction to understand that I'm gonna go through a painfully simple example, not about economics, not about healthcare, but something that I imagine is all in our shared experience, which is you gotta go, you're gonna go to lunch with your friends and it's raining and you gotta decide whether or not you're gonna wear galoshes. And this is an important decision because you don't wanna get your shoes wet on the other hand, you don't want to look stupid if you don't have to, because galoshes always kind of make you look a little silly. So, um, so here's the big decision, right? I'm going to model this two different ways. So the first way I'm going to model it is going to, I'm going to model it with um, like a logical explanation, logical theory of how the domain works. And so this is um, first order logic or pseudo first order logic. Please don't correct my logic if you're an expert at this. I haven't done this in a while. But it's the basic idea, right? So, so the first line says, oh, there exist surfaces in the world. The second one, there um, paths are, um, there exist paths in the world. The third one, paths are types of surfaces. Um, surfaces can be covered. Surfaces can be wet or dry. There are things called events, and a, um, a raining is a type of event. Uh, if uh, um, something is wet, if it's raining and that thing is not covered, there are things called people. And people wear galoshes if, when, it's, when they're walking on some surface, and that surface is wet, they wear galoshes, and they wear galoshes to protect their shoes. So I've formally modeled this domain in a mathematical logic and first order logic. I've explained everything there is to know about this domain. So now imagine act, uh, interacting with the system now. The user says, I will be walking to lunch, should I wear my galoshes? System, is it raining? Oh, come on, that's brilliant. I mean, that's a really smart system. I'm already impressed. Um, user says, yes. Uh, is the path covered? Holy crap. That system knows a lot of shit, right? So then it says, um, user, no. Um, I suggest you wear galoshes. Why? System? System? Um, if it's raining and the path is not covered, then the path is wet. If the path is wet, then people wear galoshes. Why? To protect the people's shoes. I mean, what a brilliant interaction. I mean, that's like the AI past. But it's really cool. Why is the AI past, though? Well, let's think about that. Imagine now the domain gets a little bit more complicated. So now what if it's not raining but the path may still be wet? So now I have to, I have to extend my theory right, to model that situation. It gets complicated. Now I gotta think, what are the duration of raining events? There are start times and end times. And then how long is it gonna take the water to dry? Well, it depends on what the ground retention is, depends on the temperature and the humidity, depends on the particular surface and the topology of the surface. Holy crap. I'm talking about all kinds of complicated theories that now I have to build that model into the com computer to do more precise reasoning on whether or not I should wear galoshes if in fact it was raining and now it stopped for a little while. That's a lot of work to do to make that decision. 
and to make that decision in a way it's, in which it's explicable. So I give up, and so I give up, and that takes us to around the late 80s. <laughs> and, um, and what I do is I start thinking, gee, can I do this another way? So I start saying, well, let me just collect data. So I'm just going to collect data about when humans wear galoshes. And I'm going to look at a feature like it was, so now I have a bunch of observations. I don't know how many, 1,000, 10,000. And I look at, was it raining? And did people choose to wear galoshes or not? And I could add other stuff, like was the path covered? You know, was there a wet path? Was it covered? I could just add those features in. I don't write any rules. I don't model the world in any formal way. I just give it a bunch of columns of data. And then I use some sort of machine learning to try to find, I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, but basically to, to find like the function that maps those input variables to that output variable, whether or not I should wear galoshes or not. So find the function. The function that maps those features that I put in like raining to whether or not I should wear galoshes. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, so now I ask the system, should I wear galoshes? It says yes. Why? Statistically, people wear galoshes in situations similar to yours. I'm sorry. Did you need to understand more than that? Why? It has something to do with rain, wet pads, and coverings. <laughs> so now what happens when the domain gets really complicated? Right? What do I do now? I just put more features in. I mean, I put shoe size, location, tree type, season, temperature, humidity, start time, covered, Red Sox one or not. You know, whatever I think might predict whether or not a person should wear galoshes, the color of their shoes. I mean, I don't know. And I put that stuff in. If I have enough data, I can get my statistical machine learning algorithm to find that function that more often predicts the right output than the wrong output. And I said, should I wear galoshes? Yes. Why? Just listen to me. I have an intuition. And I'm right more than 60% of the time. So what's interesting about it, I chose that word intuition on purpose because I think what's, what's interesting to me is that sometimes humans say that. So why do you think, oh, I have an intuition? Where does that come from? What are you, a crystal ball? What are you talking about, intuition, right? And sometimes I think that intuition is you've experienced a bunch of data points. You've basically kind of done that, that function. You don't really know why. You don't have a logical explanation. So you go, it's my intuition. Perhaps. So computer is intuition. So what I mean by that separate, I, just to make a point about this, is that so this is such a two-dimensional space. And what I mean by, a lot of you may know this. If, if, sorry if you already know it. Some of you may not. But so when you're looking and trying to learn a function, right, I have, I have whether, whether um, I should wear galoshes or not. And these might be different features, like whether it's raining or whether the path was covered. And let's say the red dots where you should wear galoshes and the blue dots where you should not wear, galo wear galoshes. And, if, and this line is a function that a machine er er learning algorithm, like a logistic regression, can find. And it separates the right answers from the wrong answers. So now if you put those features in, it could tell you, well, I can tell you what side you fall on. And I can predict wear galoshes, don't wear galoshes. And the... Um, the complexity, the power of the machine learning algorithm depends on the complexity of the function that it can find. So if it's linear, it finds lines. But more complex machine learning algorithms can find more complex functions. And in fact, multi-layered neural networks can find arbitrarily complex functions. So, and, and, and again, in, in these pictures, your dimensional space, just two dimensions, you know, in that example I had before, each, each feature, each, each, raw, each column is another dimension. So this is now a multi-dimensional space. But computers don't care about that. They're happy to operate in multiple dimensions. People get confused. Um, so now you could find very complex, very complex functions. And this gives you a lot of power. And one way, actually, to think about intelligence uh, is that intelligence is simply the ability to find the functions given the, the input data and the output data. Can you find that function? even if it's, if it's very complex, and how fast can you find it? And that's what makes you intelligent, period, end of story. That's an interesting definition of intelligence. Of course, not particularly appealing to humans, but it's sort of this, it's kind of this objective, you know, species-independent view of intelligence. Find the function. Just fi find the function. Here's the input data, here's the output data, find the function. Um, is it satisfying, though? In other words, is it satisfying? Does it describe the data or the mechanism 
that underlines that data, the mechanism that underlines that data, in a way that humans can understand? Does it give you the why that's ultimately satisfying to you as a human, right? Because you as a human have to make decisions. You have to make value decisions. You have to make important decisions. The computer comes back, says, I found the function. It's completely inexplicable to you. But here's the answer, and I'm often right. Assuming the past predicts the future. So it's interesting. And of course, um, you know, just recently Google announced um, the Go player, the Go player was, um, was based on a multi-layered neural network. Neural network is a function finder, finds arbitrarily complex functions. If you show it enough games, right, here are the games, here's what everybody did, here's who won, here's who lost, and I find that function between a move in the game and the likelihood you're gonna win could be an extremely complex function. I can play Go. Can I explain to you how to play Go? I don't know how to play Go. I could just show you the data that I use, but I created this big complex neural network. It's inexplicable. It's not in human terms. But that's powerful stuff, very powerful. So one of the things I want to do is I want to tell you uh, a sort of a somewhat personal story, but it's a story that, um, that I think really drives home the difference between using data and making statistics-based decisions and using logic and making very specific deductive-based decisions. So, um, so my, my father uh, at, at his birthday party at a restaurant went into cardiac arrest. And um, uh, you know, an ambulance came, but it came somewhat late. And he was brought to the, brought to the, uh, to the local hospital. And the, um, you know, the resident came out and said, you know, your father's brain dead, and um, you need to sign a do not resuscitate. Uh, because we're, you know, keeping him alive with all these unnatural means, uh, but, you know, he's brain dead. And, and so I said, well, how, how, do you know he's, uh, how do you know he's brain dead? And he said, well, there's a, um, statistically, there's a 98% chance that he's brain dead because of how long the ambulance took and his age, and, and, he, and he specified a bunch of features. And, um, I said, okay, that's statistical evidence that gives some probability for the average person. But what do you know about him? How do you know he's brain dead? And he looked at me and said, you need to talk to the chief cardiologist. Uh, okay. So um, they brought the chief cardiologist down, and he said, you know, you, you need to sign the DNR. I know this is emotionally very difficult for you, and so forth and so on, but um, your father's brain dead. I said, yeah, I heard from the resident. How do you know he's brain dead? And he gave me the same explanation, and I said, but do you have any deductive evidence that he's brain dead? He said, well, his pupils were dilated. And I said, is there, so like, I'm just going through a flow chart in my head, right? I said, oh, well, is there another reason his pupils are dilated? Pause. Well, yes, they give him a drug and then the ambulance that might dilate his pupils, good. So do you have another reason why you might know that he's brain dead? Can you get an EEG in here? Can you do this? Can you do this? So anyway, long story short, I would not sign the DNR. The doctor got very frustrated with me, thought I was wasting the hospital's resources, um, and made me make every subsequent medical decision, of which there are five or six major decisions that I had to make because he refused to make them. And long story short, about 24 hours later, my father was sitting up in bed with zero brain damage. So, um, so you know, when I, ref when I reflect on that, I think, you know, you had to know a lot about the person and the individual case, and you had to go through what I call a logical deductive proof about what mechanisms are at work. How do I actually know that this individual is brain dead? And I wasn't going to sign a DNR without that explicit personal experience. Not that, that personal, is not the, personal is not the point, but that explicit logical understanding of why I know that that person is brain dead. Right, so that's very different. So, um, and understanding that distinction is important. And when we talk about the evolution of AI, while statistical machine learning is incredibly powerful, and we're gonna use it every way we possibly can, the big question is do we wanna give up the ability to understand and provide explicable rationale for our decisions? So the holy grail in AI, in my opinion, is to autonomously learn to understand, predict, and explain. So we acquire, we understand, we predict, we explain. And it's interesting then when we, when we talked, when I spoke earlier about the source of meaning is with human beings. The role humans have in this picture. 
What data even matters to what humans are doing? What does the data mean and how useful is it and why? What, sure, let's predict what are the likely good and bad answers, but why are they good and bad? Explain them, relate to how the user understands what they already know. How do I help you understand stuff? Right, I think about how you conceptualize it and I put it in your terms. I tried to do that with the galoshes, for example. I might have missed, but I tried. Um, it's interesting, again, to observe how dependent this process is on human cognition. So what I want to do now is I'm going to, I want to switch gears just a little bit because when we look at that spectrum from um, uh, uh, theory-driven to data-driven, and we think about um, IBM's Watson, where does that fit? And it sort of fit in this interesting sp place in that spectrum, at least what I think was, is an interesting space. So anyway, just to give you some background, you know, the Watson system was designed to do what we call factoid question answering. So Jeopardy was a great challenge for exercising or for figuring out whether or not a machine can do this. Broad open domain questions, complex language. You have to be very high precision to do it right. You have to be very accurate confidence. What I mean by an ac accurate confidence is that if you were going to buzz in in Jeopardy and say, I think I got that question right, it was really important for you to get it right. Because if you got it wrong, you lost a dollar value associated with the clue, and you gave your competitors more of an opportunity to buzz in for that question and get that dollar value. So how many people know how Jeopardy works? There you go. OK. So um, game show, a bunch of clues come up. For those of you who don't know, three contestants, they have a buzzer. If they think they know an answer to the clue that came up, they have to buzz in. And if they buzz in first, they get to answer it. And the clues are like this. So if you're standing in this direction, you should look to check out the Wayne's code. Check out the Wayne's coding. How many people? Just scream it out. Any Jeopardy players in there? Huh? Down. Down. $200. Who's paying? It's not me. Who's the conference coordinator? $200. Um, see, it seems this perp was the first murderer in the Bible. To, and to top it off, he iced his own brother. Cain, right? In cell division, mitosis splits the nucleus, and cytokinesis splits this liquid cushioning the nucleus. Cytoplasm. So I heard somebody say cytoplasm. I'll tell you, it was so cold today. How cold was it? It was so cold, I wish we were back in 64 when he was emperor. Hot times, if you know what I mean. Huh? Nero, yeah. Um, of the four countries in the world that the US does not have diplomatic relations with, the one that's farthest north. North Korea is the answer. So. Um, so inter interesting language. Uh, um, you have to be, I'll show you how good you have to be. You have to be really good. And you have to know that you know. Right? You have to get that exact answer. You can't, hand, you can't hand the host the top 10 hits from Google. You have to get the exact answer. And you have to know that it's right. And you have to do it really, really quickly. So, um, so anyway, this was the, the, the problem. And at the time, no one thought it could be done. Uh, to th that degree of um, precision and, and, um, and, and computing you and ac accurate confidence. And the other thing is, like, how do you, so where do you even start? I mean, and, th and this is the point about the sweet spot, right? So, you know, we, we're not just showing the computer a bunch of Jeopardy games and saying, oh, learn how to play Jeopardy. That actually doesn't work in this case. At the same time, I'm not modeling the whole world. I mean, imagine what it would take to model all the knowledge behind this. I mean, if you're standing, it's the direction you should look to check out the Wayne's code. Okay, let's see. So let me model directions. How would I model direction? Uh, I could do like I could do north, south, east, west. I could do behind me, left, right. Okay, I can do. What else can I do? Um, I don't know. There's probably a million ways to do. Uh, I could do a compass, 360 degrees around a compass, right? And then I get a question. Uh, it's the direction of fabric, and the answer is grain. Like, I would have missed that. I wouldn't even have thought about I, I just wouldn't have gone there at all, right? And you think you're, gonna get, you're not going to get this question again, right? So you do all that work to model one thing, and you may never see it again. So, um, and then you think, well, maybe the, I don't want to, I want to show this. So, 20, so we took 20,000 random sample Jeopardy questions and just like, what were they about? Like, you know, this city or this object or this whatever it was, what were they about? And um, you got this really long tail thing where it's like, you know, the top, just in the head of the tail, only covered like 10% of the data. And it was things like group, capital, woman, film, he, singer, show, composer, title, fruit, planet, right? And then you go out, on, on you have disease, 
Senator Way insect, this dish, post, vegetable, I don't know, hat, right? So the point is, like, it just goes on and on and on with very, very low levels of, of frequency. What do you start modeling? How do you start modeling it? 13% of the clues didn't have, like, any thing at all. They just said it. Um, in fact, like this one. So Lincoln blogs. Treasury Secretary Chase just submitted this to me for the third time. Guess what, pal? This time I'm accepting it. Resignation, very good. Now, did you know the actual history, or do you, did you just do, use plausible inference? Both. You don't need to use both. <laughs> I'm, te I'm teasing you. So you used one, but you weren't completely confident. Then you brought the other one, you triangulated, and increased your confidence. Is that what you did? That's brilliant. So, um, so, but you, clearly you can, you can answer this with, without knowing the history, right? By using plausible inference. Like, what would you do in that case? You'd sit there and go, well, what kinds of things do you submit, right? And what kinds of things do you submit to a president, assuming you know Lincoln's a president, or if you're a treasury secretary? What, ki what kinds of things do you submit that are worth asking about? <laughs> so you use all this on a television show. So you use all this background knowledge to kind of triangulate, you say, I'm going to use the context that I can apply in this situation to predict the plausible inference. And so, you, in fact, you get resignation. But now you take this question and you do what we did, which we, we gave it to a sixth grade class, same question. And they also did not know the history. And they also um, used plausible inference with all the context that they could muster to interpret it. And they got a very different answer. <laughs> No context. So what are we not doing? So we're not taking a question like in cell division, mitosis plus the nucleus and cytokinesis plus this liquid cushioning nucleus and modeling everything about cellular biology. We're not doing that. Because we do that would take a year to do, and when we were done, we'd never get a question like that again on, on the thing, right? Um, so rather what we're doing is we're parsing content. Uh, we have, you know, the equivalent, I mean, uh, Watson was not connected to the internet, had become self, completely self-contained like the human was, so we could do that kind of AI comparison. But it had like the equivalent of a few million books. Um, and we're parsing it, like syntactically saying subject, verb, object, that we're trying to generalize from there and learning things like inventors, patent inventions, and officials submit resignations, and people earn degrees in schools. Basically common sense stuff. Liqu fluid is a liquid, liquid is a fluid. Huh? Which one's right? Does anybody know? Anybody a physicist? So which one's right? Is liquid a fluid or is fluid a liquid? Liquid is a fluid, right? Fluid is the more general, the more general concept than, than a liquid, so plasma is also a fluid. Um, of course, though, if you're, if, you're, if you're talking to your friend, you know, and talking you know, casually about the difference between fluids and liquids over coffee, for example, you really don't care. But if you're taking a physics test, it's important to know the difference. So depending, so in, in a common corpus, you'll find both as equally occurring, equally frequent. But if you're taking a physics test and, and training on physics data, you're going to find one more frequent than the other. Vessels sink. But what, what, what context? People sink eight balls in the context of pools. So you want to represent the context in which that induced fact is true. So we do, we do a lot of that. Um, and ultimately, you'd be able to have to, you have to solve it generally. We can't model the domain. You basically have to look at words and phrases and figure out what they, how they likely relate to one each other. You build language models to predict what the likely next word is, like submitted this. What are the likely things you would do? And you could do that. You could do that with shallow linguistics. You could look at a lot of data, and you look at how phrases and words co-occur. But how good did you have to be to win Jeopardy? So this is, um, this is uh, uh, what we call the winner's cloud. This is uh, actual games that Je Jeopardy players played. And what we're plotting for each dot, what we're plotting is on the x-axis, we're plotting the number of um, questions that, that the winning player of that dot got a chance to answer. So like, take a dot in the middle. Let's like, be really careful. Take a dot over here somewhere and draw that down to the x-axis. 45% or whatever it is, 47%. So that means that the winning player of that game was fast enough and smart enough to get in there and get the chance to, to answer first on 47% of the questions. And if you go to the y-axis, it's doing about 
accuracy. In other words, that's how many they're getting right of the ones they got a chance to answer. The red dots were Ken Jennings games. Ken Jennings was like the best Jeopardy player in the world or whatever. He won 72 games in a row. I mean, he was like an oddball. I mean, the guy was you know, genetically engineered to play Jeopardy or something, right? I mean, he's like a way outlier. His average game, he's acquiring 62% of the board. He's got games where he's acquiring 82% of the board, meaning you don't even know who else is playing, really. You're just watching him answer question after question. So really, you know, an outlier. And like, what gave him the confidence to think he could just buzz in like that? He probably assumed he knew everything. Unfortunately for his competitors, he was largely right. He was doing about 90%, you know, high 80s, whatever, 90% on the average game. As low as 80, but still pretty good, right? And this was a state-of-the-art QA system, and that's a, its confidence curve. So I want to explain that because that's important. So what happens here is the way this is, curve is set up is that if the system had to answer five, the, the V5% of the questions it was most confident in, this is how many it would get right. As you added more and more questions that it was less and less confident in, when it went to answer you know, nearly 100% of the questions, it was only doing about 12%. And that's a terrible confidence curve, right? It's crappy. It's not predicting its confidence very well, right? What would a perfect confidence curve look like? Any mathematicians in here? It's really simple. No. It would look, so at, like, the idea is that as you thought you're, you were right, you were right. And as you, your confidence decreased, you started to get them wrong. So it would look like this. So go along the top and then come down like that, if it was, if it was good. So um, I'm going to skip these. And some, so um, the idea was to produce, to produce good, to look at the question, to understand it as best as you can, to break it up, to try to find possible answers, and to judge those answers. And to say, what is the likelihood they're right or wrong? Right? And also to deal with really, conf really tough questions, like a long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. Anybody? Harang. What's that? Harang. Harang, harang, that's right. And so you ha now here, the point is like, you have to break the question up into parts, solve them independently, and put them back together. Right? When 60 Minutes premiered, this man was US president. So the reason I put this up is because, again, it's a multi-step thing. No one wrote anywhere anything about these, didn't connect these two facts. So again, the, this, the Watson is looking over large amounts of data. The answer has to be there somewhere. The trick is it may be phrased in very different ways than which it's asked. So the challenge was really figuring out the meaning equivalence. Does this language over here in this question have anything to do with this language over here in this passage I found? So the system is looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of possible passages, then trying to figure out what's the likelihood this passage might, ans might answer the question. Now, can I get a, a precise interpretation that tells me that these two things might mean the same thing so it could increase the probability that, that an answer in that passage might be the right answer? That's kind of what it's doing. So it's doing meaning equivalence, which is different than doing meaning. We were talking about meaning before. It's not actually getting at the meaning. It's just taking two things and doing meaning equivalence, which is hard enough, given the ambiguity of language. And who knows if you have to break up the clue or not. Maybe you have to break it up. Maybe you don't. There's Linda B. Johnson. So if you take this step through step, it's taking a question like that cell division question. It's figuring out what the key terms are. It's figuring out what the possible relationships are, like cushioning and splits. It's searching through many, uh, a large corpus um, to find passage and documents. And then it's coming back here, and it's doing this whole thing of finding out what are even reasonable answers. I find 500 possible answers. But they could be crazy. Organelle, vacuole, cytoplasm, which happens to be right, plasma, mitochondria, blood, uh, chromosomes, meiosis. So lots of possible answers. And then for each of those answers, it's now splitting off a separate process. And it's saying, let's assume for a moment that answer's right. Can I find content that supports this answer as an answer to that question? Now it goes and retrieves all this supporting evidence. And then for each evidence answer pair, so if I have 100 possible answers, and for each of those I have 100 possible passages that might support or refute that answer, I now have 10,000 um, answer passage pairs. And now, OK, what do I do with those answer passages? How do I know that this answer is supported by that passage when I don't understand anything? So what the researchers on my team did was come up with hundreds of um, algorithms 
that come up with features. Remember in our, our simple galoshes example, we came up with features like was the path covered, is it this, all things that might predict the answer. So now we have hundreds of possible feature, features that might predict the answer. They look at grammatical structure, they look, look, look at um, um, the words and the uh, frequency of the words, they look at semantics, they look at similarity measures, they look at all kinds of things. Spatial information, temporal information, they come up with numbers. So imagine now there's 100 of those, actually more than closer to 500 of those, but just to make the numbers round, I have 10,000, right, times 100, I have a million answer, passage, score, triples. I have to combine all of those into a final probability for each answer, a final likelihood, a final confidence. So I come up with cytoplasm, 90% sure, plasma, 52% sure, blood, 42% sure. I don't understand anything in the way that we think about understanding. But what's interesting is I have evidence because I have the passages that supported the answer. And that was, and that was, that was extremely important. This is the overall architecture. It took um, uh, about two hours to answer a single question on like one three gigahertz, 64, you know, meg CPU or whatever, a gig CPU. Um, three hours a question would make for a very boring game. So it scaled out, ultimately we scaled Watson out to 2,880 cores, 15 terabytes of RAM, couldn't go to disk, and we were able to answer within two to, two to four seconds. Um, and this is the system that ultimately, ultimately won. And you'll look at, at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the research, this was our confidence curve. Really nice shape and slicing right across the winner's cloud, meaning that it had a good chance of winning the best players. Would it necessarily win? No. Um, because it would depend on the questions, it would depend on the competition, it would depend on a bunch of things, but it was a competitive player. And um, in fact, going into the game, we predicted we had about a 72% chance of winning, so I had a 28% chance of losing my job. <laughs> so if you look at the AI comparison, you got, you know, the Watson, at the time, I mean, IBM, I, I, I don't work for IBM right now, but at, uh, IBM, I know, has advanced this to make it much smaller and, and tighter and, and that kind of stuff. But at the time, it was like, it was like the equivalent of like 10 refrigerators, um, 2,880 CPUs, 15 terabytes of RAM, we had one brain, uh, 10 refrigerators fits in a shoebox. 80 kilowatts of electricity, powered, two, two and a sandwich, glass of milk maybe, 20 tons of cooling, a hand fan or not, four years plus two million books of content, I don't know, 30 years of human learning, I don't know what it takes to win a, win a Jeopardy. But anyway, that was kind of like the, both sort of self-contained systems. Of course, what's interesting is that this, per, this, um, this intelligent agent can then walk off stage on its own, tell a couple of jokes, laugh with you. This one was like, what's the next question? I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so the interesting, one of the really powerful ideas that came out of this was exactly that point, and that's the point I wanted to make. Like we have theory driven, we have data driven. So Watson wasn't theory driven. We didn't build a big understanding of the world. And it wasn't purely data driven either. We used machine learning, and I should, and I should be really clear about where machine, a particular place where machine learning was used here. So when you got all these scores from all these, you know, hundreds of algorithms here, when you got all those scores back and you have to combine them, how do you weigh them? Like, how do you weigh them? Is this one, spatial one, more important than the typing one? Is the temporal one more important than the, the term overlap one? How do you weigh them? So machine learning was used to figure out the weights on all those various algorithms. You can think of those algorithms as different experts, and they were all weighing in. They were all saying, here's what I think. But like, if you're a CEO of a company, and you have 20 advisors, and they all give you their opinion, which one do you weigh? Whose opinion do you weigh more than others? How would you know whose opinion to weigh more than others? You would have experience with them, and you find out, well, this person's often right under these conditions. This person's often right under those conditions. This person is more expert at this than that person. And you learn the weights through experience. So Watson would run on many games, and it would learn the weights for all those features. And so machine learning was absolutely critical. Otherwise, how would you weigh this? Like, you know, human can't do that. Can't figure out how to weigh those things. And that's where we had these various weights or various models, and we'd apply them at the end. 
So that was an important role of, 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 mach uh, you know, of machine learning in, in the system. So when you look at theory-driven and data-driven, Watson was kind of a, an interesting place in the middle where we didn't build a giant theory of the world. We didn't just say, oh, go learn how to play Jeopardy in some inexplicable way. We actually came back and said, here are the answers. Here's our confidences. Here's why we think the answer is. But the why is coming from, here are the passages that we scored as likely supportive or likely refutive of the answer that a human can go read. So human implies the understanding. The computer didn't have the understanding. It can't give you that logic behind it. So some of the hardest questions in Jeopardy, actually. So anyway, I want to drive that point home, and I'm, and I'm going to hit that one more time, and then I'm going to be done, and I'll let you guys go. So um, and there'll be a, a test next week. So, uh, so, but I wanted to hit one other point, which is like some, one of the really interesting questions in Jeopardy were the, were the final Jeopardy questions that required you to do multiple hops of reasoning. So here's one. On the hearing of the, of the discovery of George Mallory's body, he told his reporters he still thinks he was first. Anybody know? The answer is Edmund Hillary. He was first at Mount Everest. But there's something missing here. What's missing is Mount Everest. So what you had to do was kind of break the clue up um, and, and connect things to other things, and then find these, these, these paths of connections. So you get from George Mallory to all the things related to George Mallory, to Mount Everest, still thinks he was first that phrase, to, um, to somebody who was first at Mount Everest, you get Edmund Hillary. Now this is not the only path, you're gonna find a ton of paths, right? So you're gonna figure out how to score these paths, but the point is you, the answer wasn't, even, even in ambiguous language, which is the hard part, wasn't written in one place. You had to find a piece here, a piece there, and you had to connect them, which is really cool. So it got better and better at these questions. And when we went to medical questions, they were more like this. We had to piece together different pieces of fact and, and find that path through the literature. You ever search on stuff on Google, and you're sitting there and you're trying to solve a medical problem or whatever it is you're doing, and you find one doctor, and you know, that's part of the answer, and then you take that information and you go and you find something else, and that's part of the answer, and then you connect those two things together and you find something else, and that's part of the answer, and then you have to kind of connect them all together and then you know what you're talking about. So that's what Watson paths does. So now here we have this question from a United States medical licensing exam. A 63-year-old patient is sent to the neurologist with a clinical picture of resting tumor that began two years ago. At first it was only of the left hand, and now it comprises the whole arm. At physical exam, the patient has unexpressed face and difficulty in walking, et cetera. So what we do is we take that thing, we break it up into different facts, like 63-year-old, resting tremor, uh, unexpressed face, difficulty walking, blah, blah, blah. And then we look at the, all the possible answers. It could be 100 of these things, and, or there could be a few. And what we do is we start asking Watson questions, like, what is this indicated with? What is it associated with? What does it contain? What does it affect? What does it affect? What is it caused by? And then we start with the, the possible answers, and we ask the inverse question. And as we get answers, we start doing that recursively. And then you find paths that connect the things in the question with the possible answers, and each one of those paths have a confidence associated with it. And you learn how to combine those confidences, and you see where they pull. Turns out, they, you know, they pull more often than not at the right answer. And then what happens is you have a chain of explanations. So you didn't write a single if-then rule, but you cut, cut a path in the literature that explains the answer to the question that involves a lot of different facts moving through a lot of different internal nodes or, or different sort of you know, concepts that are important to that problem. So this is a very interesting way to approach these multi-step you know, inferences without writing a single F then rule. It's very interesting. Again, not an understanding that can explain the mechanisms of medicine. So not that logical model theory driven stuff, which would be really cool. We still need to get there. But not a black box either. It's so very interesting. So reflections on Watson. Innovation through new architectures. Combining a diversity of skills and methods. Lots of different algorithms. But the bottom line is yet for a computer program to really understand language. And this is kind of where I want to take a step back and then I'm going to end. So my view is we need machines to go beyond the words and their patterns. We need them to understand. So what I want you to do is I want you to imagine, imagine a collaborative thought partner that can truly understand and explain its understanding in fluent human language dialogue tailored to you, the listener, or the user who wants to understand. No such capability exists today. 
Cracking this problem would dramatically, dramatically accelerate access to um, actionable understanding and better, faster decision making. So let me give you an example of such a dialogue. So I'd like to better understand stem cell research. How can I help with that? I'd like to discuss these articles on the role of stem cells in organ regeneration, both from a technical perspective and from an ethical perspective. Computer, uh, um, computer says, okay, this content, oh, you read it already, this content suggested stem cells can be very effective at organ regeneration, the technology works because stem cells contain blah, 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 and act and so forth, open challenges remain regarding ethical concerns, including, God, that would be beautiful. Why, though, do stem cells gravitate to the area of injury? What does it mean for them to differentiate? Computer says, I explained this already. <laughs> Um, but I can do better. Would you like me to rephrase, rephrase my explanation in terms you are more likely to be familiar with? <laughs> yes, I would, actually. <laughs> well, you know, since you're a programmer, imagine some cells assume that a class is in a programming language, like Java. These cells can be specialized to perform more specific functions, much the same way that, like I get goosebumps, I don't know about you. <laughs> but um, this is, you know, this is what, you know, you want from computers. You want that thought partnership, that ability to deeply understand, map to a conceptual, logical model, and to communicate back, that back to a user based on how the user is likely to conceptualize the world. Can computers do that today? Can computers do that today? No, they can't do that today. That's what we want them to do. So, in fact, here's a simple first grade story. It's so simple, I'm gonna read it to you. John and Mary were running a race. John fell, he hurt his knee. Mary looked back, Mary wanted to win. If she kept running, she would win. Mary stopped, she ran back, she helped John up. Everybody got it? So can you answer those questions? Who was running a race? John and Mary, right? Because you could look at running a race and you could just go running a race, John and Mary. Who wanted to win? Mary. Who hurt his knee? He hurt his knee. Who's he? We got to do co-reference resolution. Um, not that hard in this case. This is probably John hurt his knee. Now what about these questions. What was Mary looking at? Probably John. Doesn't say it though, right? But you have a mental model in your head. You're picturing, I can imagine what you're picturing. Two kids running a race, maybe it's the autumn, decent weather, otherwise why would they be running the race? Um, you're imagining John fell his knee, Mary feels bad, she's looking back, of course she's looking back at John. Doesn't say any of that, but you know all those answers. What did, what did Mary stop? Mary stopped, I don't know what she stopped. You know what she stopped, right, she stopped running. Uh, where did she run back to? She ran back. Just to help John, right? Because you got this model in your head. What did Mary decide to do? Doesn't say anything about Mary deciding anything in here. But you know what she decided to do. How about this? Did Mary win? You're not sure, but you can guess, guess. She helped, she helped John, probably not. What was the weather? You, you're not sure, was she wearing a I like that, can I hire you for my other talk? Um, how, old, uh, how old are John and Mary? You know, I mean, if they were adults, probably wouldn't be helping each other. <laughs> right, so probably younger. There's just an enormous amount of context that you're bringing to, the, I, oh, they're gonna tell me I have to go, I know. So I'm gonna skip this. Um, and I'm basically gonna just say a couple words, which is that, um, this is just the beginning, right? This type of understanding is what we need computers to do. And we need computers to go from this level of understanding to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, so they could sit down there and they could read everything and anything we want them to read. And they can interpret it and build a logical model that can fluently dialogue with us. So I think this is possible. I do think this is possible. Do I think it will involve machine learning? I do think it will involve machine learning. Will um, statistical machine learning and induction, will it involve building logical models that will also involve that. So ultimately the way I think about it is I think about it as like a this is this virtual cycle, like true thought partnership with computers, the grand collaboration between mind and machine that's going to involve human cognition, it's going to involve theory building, it's going to involve data, uh, machine learning and induction, it's going to involve reasoning, logical representations and reasoning, as well as language understanding, and it's going to be a continuous cycle where human and machine interacting continuously 
learning together so that they can have that shared understanding and computers can act as thought, thought partners for humans. Thank you. If the past, if the past doesn't predict the future, you ev it's even more so the case that you want to make sure you have a mechanistic model of how the world works. And that's exactly the point. If you're relying strictly on machine learning, that's, that's the bet you're making. Okay? All right, thank you.